Greetings, Green Garden guy, back here again. Um, I'm still around. Today I'd like to talk about crop planning. Um, I have people ask me frequently, you know, Bill, what should I grow? Uh, or I meet people uh, quite often who have a plan and they're thinking they want to grow this, they want to grow that. And, <clears throat> you know, it's really... It matters a bit as to whether you're just going to garden or whether this is a market garden or whether it's a small farm, okay? Your choices are really going to be determined uh, by a number of parameters that I'll get into. Uh, if you're the home gardener, then the answer that I give everybody is very simple. Grow what you like to eat. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That, it, you know, past that, uh, of course, if you live in Minnesota and you love to eat bananas, no, well, it's not a good choice. Um, on the other hand, you know, cucumbers and cabbages and zucchini and tomatoes and all manner of different apples uh, grow really well in Minnesota. And so uh, you're going to have to balance what you eat and like to eat against uh, what's known to grow locally uh, when you get past the novice stage with it, then you begin to experiment and you start trying to do things that maybe other people haven't done, you know, that aren't well known. And that can work. I've, I've done this. It does work sometimes. Um, so, you know, for the home gardener, if you're growing mostly for yourself, your family, and your friends, eh, you plant the stuff that you all really like eating. Now, if you're a market gardener, which is, you know, another step up in crop planting, because here you've probably got enough land at your disposal and uh, enough uh, energy in your back and time to be able to, to do a larger project where you may very well have uh, extra produce that can go to a farmer's market, that can go to uh, charities, you know, it can go to, uh, well, the Hawaii Food Basket, for instance. There are all sorts of places that, that, that extra produce can end up. And, uh, uh, and it, it will help in, enrich you and it make the garden more profitable so it's not uh, as much of an expense. When you get to the market gardener stage, you're usually uh, taking in money and you're selling enough of the stuff that you're offsetting the cost of you know the cultivation and the fertilizers and the work and stuff you had to go to. Uh, and then, of course, if you're beyond that and your small farming operation, for instance, uh, which I know I have a few small farmers that listen to my channel, for the small farmer, this is where it really meets the road. You have to start to think carefully about planning what sorts of crops are you actually going to try to grow where you live. Um, now, some of the parameters around that. And this will also go back down to the market gardeners here too. And, and that would be definitely what's in demand. So, you know, what do people want where you're at? And that's not too hard to figure out, really. I mean, if, you, if you're not sure about it, you know, go on down to your local farmer's market and talk to some of the folks in the booth, and they'll probably tell you what their hot items were, you know. You usually tell just by what they're laying out, because after they've been in business for a while, they don't put out stuff that people don't want, usually. Um, so that's one way. You market research, go talk to the produce guy if you've got a friendly one at one of your good local supermarkets or natural food stores, and uh, see what they have to say about items, how they traffic, you know, things maybe that are a little bit hard to get. That's where we start to get to it now. Things that are a little bit more difficult to produce maybe, or ship, for instance, maybe you're right on top of your market. And maybe otherwise they got to go all the way to California or something to get that stuff. And so maybe it doesn't ship very well, or its shelf life is pretty short, you know. These are niches, things to consider when you're uh, working on trying to grow a crop for selling. Uh, you know, is there a demand? Um, does the, um, the demand exceed the supply? That's an important one right there. If there's more demand for what you are going to grow uh, than, uh, than there is actual natural supply, well, for a while at least, till it catches up with the market, you got it made. Yeah, I mean, that's a sweet spot to be in, uh, is to have something everybody wants when nobody else has got it. 
then you have to look at what is feasible with the kind of soil conditions you have, the growing equipment that you're using, and definitely the weather, the environment where you live. You know, some crops grow a lot better in deserts. Other crops grow a lot better in humid regions. I don't think I'd be starting an apple farm in, uh, in low or high desert in the state of Arizona, for instance. Um, on the other hand, uh, Arizona is pretty well adapted to things like pomegranate. Really good pomegranates there. They also grow some of the most delicious grapefruits. Uh, pecans seem to be pretty good in Arizona. For so, even though they are native to Illinois, they like the state. You know, so there are, there are things that will grow in these more desert type climates. Um, of course, there's always cactus fruit. You know, if it's uh, if you're living in Minnesota, well, obviously apples are a really good choice for a fruit crop. You know. Um, I'd say probably at least during its growing season, uh, the upper Midwest and the Great Lakes area of, of the country and the uh, uh, upper Northeast uh, probably raise a wider variety of different vegetables than you, know, you can raise in a lot of different places. The, the, the corn belt uh, type conditions, the central U.S. conditions oftentimes are really conducive to uh, in the summer to raising a whole lot of different kinds of produce. If you're, you know, in Illinois and you're thinking about this, watching this video, you have a lot of stuff that you can do. And of course, then you're gonna look at the fact though that, you know, it, it, depending on the kind of growing conditions you have, it will depend on how these crops are gonna come, uh, how big the crops are gonna be, what's the succession of them. You know, say here, for instance, in Hawaii, where I'm located, um, I can raise sweet corn 12 months out of the year, and I don't have to worry about the season, all right? Um, I can raise uh, cabbages, Chinese cabbages, broccoli will grow 12 months out of the year here. So we, we don't have these tight considerations as far as timing. But if you're living, you know, say in the upper Midwest, uh, there you're probably going to have to start your year with some sort of a crop that's probably cool tolerant and maybe faster moving into and overlapping with things like the tomatoes and the zucchinis and and then there's of course there's this the fall late winter type squashes and all that too which really tend to come towards the very end of the season and so you know s staging what you're growing for your marketplace matching it to your climate and conditions because you're going to tail off again the other way into fall and so that it's going to get cool and you're going to want things that have frost tolerance kale for instance you know uh, you may have green onions out there in the fall these are all great items i mean it sells scallions all day long man believe me uh it sounds silly but so you know, to stop there with some of this and, 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 and to the, the crux, to the core of what I'm thinking here. And when it comes to uh, uh, home gardening, okay, you guys can do whatever you want that feels good. And if even if it's a tremendous amount of work to the point that you'd probably have been better off buying the stuff, you know, it, it's still, it's cool. It's worth it. You know, do whatever you want. But if you're going to start to try to make some kind of a living off what you're doing, you have a few things you really got to consider that are outside of what the gardener does. You know, uh, like I have guys come here periodically and say, well, you know, they're going to grow vanilla. And I mean, vanilla grows really good here. It does. Um, I love vanilla, and we have ripe vanilla <laughs> right now coming in. Ellen brought in some beans yesterday. She's sweating. Um, and But it is so much work. Oh, my goodness. Uh, the only thing I can think of that's even more work probably is coffee. All right. Uh, Cacao is pretty bad, too. These are very, there are crops that are extremely labor-intensive. All right. So you have to consider... A, what is the amount of actual work you have to put in to be able to get this stuff? Now, Hawaiian organic vanilla is about worth the price of gold gram for gram. I mean, it is expensive. It's some of the most expensive vanilla on earth. But it's also, wow, one of the most labor-intensive crops, you know. Um, and it takes quite a while to get it into production. And so, uh, you know, you got, that's the other factor, your turn time. Now, let's say, um, to be very generic about this, let's say in your mind you're, you want to grow fruit orchards for sale. 
you know, whether it be citrus groves in California or uh, apple orchards in Michigan, you know, cherries in Oregon or whatever you're thinking, or mixed orchard crops, um, no matter what it is that you have in mind, it's going to take you a significant investment in both uh, materials and time to be able to actually get this going. I figure you're going to be at waiting probably at least six years before anything really starts to happen on most of these crops. You know, in some cases, you're going to be waiting 10 years or 15 years, you know, or more. Um, you know, the macadamia nuts, for instance, which grow really well here in Hawaii, boy, they took a long time to get to the point where they got a decent crop on them. They're a good tree. They work well here, and there's a market for them. But, um, boy, that's a, it, it, it's a long-term time. And so, if you're putting all your nuts in one basket, um, you might want to think about diversifying. Things like vegetable truck. All right, one reason that vegetable farming uh, is pretty fairly common <laughs> and can be reasonably profitable, depending on your situation, is that the turn time on vegetables is really short. I mean, you know, it only takes you a month to grow a radish. <laughs> <laughs> right? In, in one month, you're in the radish farming business. Um, so, you know, and broccoli is 60 days or so. You can cut it again, you know, you can get another yield off of broccoli, depending on what variety you're raising, and so on. Uh, so, you really need to look hard at no matter what your dream is, you know. Like, we get people coming here from the mainland with these tropical dreams. Here you are, you're in Hawaii, you know. And uh, certainly there are a number of tropical crops that are, you know, good here. You know, bananas. Uh, people are going out of the banana farming business because of the bunchy pop virus that got here. Um, I don't know, they're not worth much either. Now, I grow lots of them. I like them. If I had to make my money on bananas, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it takes a lot of bananas, a lot of acreage to make any money off that crop. Um, it's more profitable as a nursery item, <laughs> raising different varieties of the plants and having them cultivated in pots to sell to people who want to grow bananas, I believe is far more profitable. Actually, probably a little easier, too, uh, than, than raising the fruit itself. There's all these... Goofy little factors wrapped around stuff, you know. Uh, integrating uh, uh, an orchard project with vegetable truck. Because you can get, like I say, 30 days to a radish, buddy. It might take you 30 years to get a durian tree to fruit, but it's only 30 days for a radish. And there's crops that step up through all that, you know. So these things will tide you over and get you through the lean times while you're waiting for that inevitable uh, end crop. You know, one of the reasons that some of these crops are um, uh, scarce uh, is, is just that. They're so hard to produce profitably. You know, well, the pawpaw, which is a favorite fruit of mine, and it'll grow over a lot of the mainland U.S. too. Um, the pawpaw it is a really nice Native American fruit tree. It's the largest Native American fruit tree that is the size of the fruit uh, of any anything that we had um, before Europeans settled here. And it has that uh, surprising exotic taste uh, of a fruit that doesn't really belong in Paw Paw, Michigan. In your mind, it seems like it should be in Ecuador or something for the flavor of it, because most all the relatives are tropical, you know, and it carries that. But uh, the plant takes a long time to come into yield. Um, a whole lot of people out there have no idea yet even what this thing is. Um, it's an odd-looking fruit, and oh my God, is it a hard thing to try to get to market? Oh, it's terrible. It would be, I think, the number one reason why most people won't go into this business. I mean, when I had pawpaw trees in California, I would go out, I would gently pick them by hand, take them from the tree, put them on the counter and go up to them the next morning to have them with my cereal, and I would see brown fingerprints from where I touched the skin. Yeah, you know, they're that sensitive. So the, the pawpaw is one of the more difficult fruits to handle 
that I've ever run across. It's it's a rough one. You know, white sapote is pretty bad too that way. But there are ways around these things. You know, it, it, I used to sell all my pawpaws pick your own. And well, that <laughs> That was the easiest way to cope with it because they came, they looked great, they were good in the tree, they picked them, they brought them home, they looked like a dead potato the next morning, not my problem. <laughs> you know, so it kind of got me off the hook that way. Pick your own operations are definitely a thing to think about. Uh, you don't see them too much in the western U.S. That's kind of scarce. But in the eastern United States, um, at least at a time, the pick-your-own operation was a pretty big deal. Wisconsin, we used to have uh, raspberry farms, pick-your-own. We had strawberry farms that were pick-your-own. You know, we'd probably do pick-your-own strawberries here in Hawaii, except the liability of the rat lungworm slug thing. I don't think I want to get into this. Um, but definitely, with the fact that strawberries are way down there on the ground, and my back ain't the best, having to bend over for hours and hours on end uh, to pick strawberries is not my line of work. Don't like it. Um, so picking raspberries is more of my business standing up. Uh, so, you know, you get it to, if you can get people to pick the produce themselves without completely destroying the farm, you know, but then you get other liability issues too. So there's a lot of things to think about when you're planting the crop. Uh, it's it's just amazing. Um, I'm sure that half of the things that you all might be pr confronted with, I'm not even thinking about because they're they're not necessarily on my page from where I'm sitting because uh, there's there's so many different possible factors. But starting off with choosing what you like to eat is really a good idea. Uh, I think choosing a crop for gardening and farming is pretty much the same as picking a stock for the market, at least from my point of view. I don't ever pick a stock that I don't already use the product somehow or another, or at least most of the time. So I'd say 80% of my picks are something that I'm intimately involved with anyway and believe in, so I invest in it. Well, it goes the same thing with a crop. You know, you know I, Who's going to plant watermelons, really, if you hate the things? That just doesn't make sense. You know, you know You're never going to produce beautiful watermelon if you don't really like them and so loving whatever it is that you're getting into uh, ahead of the game because after a few years you gotta learn to hate it anyway <laughs> so you better start off with a little love in your heart yeah uh, anyway so there we go a little bit about selecting crops aloha y'all have a Great season this year and hang loose.